This clip is brought to you by SaveWithConrad.com. I mean, a lot of people poke fun at this idea. I mean, Eric Bischoff has gone on record as saying, I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard because apparently he was riding with Lori, uh, somewhere and your dad called and just sort of soft pitched the idea and, uh, Bischoff shut it down and then looked at Lori afterwards and said, that's one of the worst ideas I've ever heard. And mm -hmm. I think it, everybody was sort of of that mindset when they first heard the idea, because it was just different from the norm. You know, it's, it, it, we get used to doing things a certain way and that's the way it's done until it's not. And this was a revolutionary concept, you know, for, for years, TV was filled with squash matches, because if you want to see the actual match, you got to come to a live event. And then eventually it changed and we started to get more main event matches on TV and we would build towards a pay-per-view and, you know, we would take three months to sell that pay-per-view. And of course that changed too. And then it became a monthly thing. And these days pay-per-views aren't even really a thing, you know, I mean, certainly they are outside of WWE, but now it's all the big streaming model. So the business has evolved a lot, but TNA was really the first company to say, no, this is where it's going to exist. And as a reminder, just to add context, we're having this conversation in January of 02, a month later, ring of honor is going to be born out of necessity. Uh, for years, Rob Feinstein had built his RF video uh, business off of the backs of ECW. He would sell fan cams and monthly subscriptions to people who couldn't get the ECW syndicated show, et cetera, et cetera. And now there's essentially a, a, a group of super indie talent and they're going to be running shows and they're hoping to offset the loss of, Hey, we don't have ECW tapes anymore. Now we've got, you know, ring of honor tapes. So same great talent that you remember. A lot of new faces, the best of the world, the super indies, if you will, but it's a subscription service by videotape. So everyone is having to get competitive with their sort of outside of the box thinking. Would you agree with that? Oh gosh. Uh, and, and, and to add that layer into it. And what's fascinating is that just sort of how you laid it out and look, me and Eric are, are not business partners, because, but we're podcast family members. Sure. Sure. <laughs> So, so I love, it's fascinating to hear that because Eric's the one who pushed the envelope and said, uh, uh, we ain't doing four a year. We're doing 12 a year. That's right. Uh, and yet, so when you say, oh, wait a minute, are you crazy, Eric? You're going to milk this cow. You're going to kill it. Blah, blah, blah. Nope. That didn't happen. What did uh, Vinny Mac do? Oh, well, we got to create in your house. So just the evolution. And look, was it a brilliant idea? Oh my God. No. But what were the options? One, yeah. what was the strategy? Create a business plan, sustainable and see where it took us. And then sort of when you, uh, again, floating back out of that. So from 93 to 96, I mean, we've talked about my career, but you know, uh, I'm, I'm WWF then WCW, then back to WWF, back to the WCW. So both companies, I tried to dial into pay-per-view. So when you look at the amount of pay-per-view buys done on a monthly basis, on a monthly basis from WWF and WCW, and then boom, March, the pay-per-view companies very quickly, and they will, I'm assuming we're going to get into this, but they were like, hey, Vince's buy rates, matter of fact, not only did they not go up and WCW fans flocked to you. The, I went down. Down. So you have Coca-Cola buyers or Pepsi buyers. You have Wendy hamburger customers and McDonald hamburger customers, and you have some brand loyalty. Not everybody just jumped. And it's oh. well documented, but the pay per view universe of people who would impulse buy was substantial. And so, by giving a nine ninety nine price point, and you know, multiply that times four, and so that's forty bucks, and that's roughly what a pay per view was during those times. So we're not going to get them every week because look, we come from a weekly territory, and there were lots of folks that came every Monday night but didn't watch it every Saturday morning. They came to watch quote unquote, the big stuff. We came to watch the payoff, just what you said, the live event. So creatively, the concept was make it quote unquote, not every match pay-per-view worthy, but a pay-per-view worthy event every week. That's episodic. And you have a blow off every main event and you have semi main events and opening matches that build toward the next week. So that's sort of it in a nutshell. Um, but you know, 
creatively, that's where we were uh, headed. But the other options, you tell me. Uh, I, I, I knew that, that you know, McManus's Harlem Globetrotter mindset, which I, I, I really liked, but I also knew that in long-term sustainable, because after about two years or three years, they're like, oh, wait, those guys used to be in current storylines. That, 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 that was eventually going to run out. Your dad wrote that Jay Hosman was in the pay-per-view business and he worked for Evander Holyfield, but at the time, but he's interested in coming to work for you guys. Can you give us any more backstory on Jay Hasman and why he was important enough for a meeting like this, basically before anyone else? It, it was the pay-per-view uh, concept to get in again. How are we going to stay back to your title? Let's start a wrestling promotion. If we're going to start a wrestling promotion, you have to start with stories. You, you, you know, you, yes, you can have talent, but Andrew had talent, but there was no episodic nature. And, and, you know, our industry, whether it's Raw, SmackDown, whatever it is, it's the episodic nature. It's yes, it's talent, but it's really storyline driven. It's the male soap opera, however you want to cache it. But Jay had uh, obviously lost his WCW business. He was an executive on the WCW side who was no longer in the WCW pay-per-view industry. Uh, he had some different accounts in boxing and, uh, he had a partner named Lynn Sabal. So they were, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to think of what their original company was called, but basically a pay-per-view consulting services, you know, I see. you go to Hollywood now you get an agent, uh, but you also got to get a production company that, that, that is in, in alignment with, um, I'll, I'll say approved, uh, you know, they had, um, uh, swinging door, uh, uh, open door relationships with in-demand direct and dish that uh, knew the contracts. So essentially a consulting service uh, for the pay-per-view industry. So let's talk about um, how that meeting goes. I mean, it, he sort of indicated in the book, he being your dad pronouns, pal, that Jay said, Hey, if you get this wrestling thing off the ground, we'd be into it that's really just because he's trying to look for that lost revenue from wrestling before. Right. He, he, and I, we knew, I mean, he, yes, he, he wanted an account a matter of fact. And, and that's another thing that when you talk about sort of falling in love with this industry, uh, we don't have seasons, Yeah, uh, you know, that it's, I've said it a gazillion times, but you know, we don't have seasons, but, but we're also not that anomaly like in boxing and now MMA, that one big fight. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, oh boy, let's hope uh, Tyson Holyfield go longer than one round, but it's the big fight mentality. It's that episodic nature and coming off of WCW once a month, that is real music to pay-per-view provider uh, ears that, that you're not going to come down three or four times a year and Tyson's fighting twice or whoever it is. This is a, you know, went from a monthly to a weekly. Yes, the price point were lower, but it's, continuous work and continuous promotion and marketing collateral and current and live programming. You know, it's not a rerun of a movie or on-demand movie or whatever it may be. It, 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 and it's not a concert that comes along through forms. It's event programming consistently. Your, uh, your dad wrote the cost of the first show was budgeted at $800,000. Does that number ring a bell? TNA show. The very first TNA show that you guys had laid out and the initial budget was going to be 800 grand. No. Where, where would we spend 800 grand? I, and I'm, <laughs> I asked because he wrote that he was advised, um, that getting an investor and essentially giving up equity is foolish because the initial show was really the only money at risk because after that, all that's needed is a line of credit secured against the pay-per-view, you know, revenue receivables. So that really the only money that you could sort of be pushing all in and lose is the cost of that first show. If it's just a total flop, but if it's not, there's money coming right behind it, but he budgets or he wrote in the book, the budget was 800 grand. Now I'm not saying that's what it wound up being for the first show, but that was at least the preliminary idea. We'll call it February, March. That seems high to you. Wait, like double. Okay. It, that, 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 I mean, it, it could have been 400, like 800 for the month. 
Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.